Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday Worship here with us at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's good to see uh, us all gathered together in person. And if you're joining us live on the live stream, welcome. Uh, if you all look at the camera mount, we did a very good job of mounting it to the ceiling so we don't have a tripod anymore. So well done to the AV team um, and Deacon Talk from the KM who helped us install. Uh, since this new year, for the last three months, we've been going through the book of James. Um, the series is titled Faith in Action, and today we close our time in the Apostle James' love letter and encouragement to the church uh, in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And the sermon today is titled Restoration in Prayer. Restoration in Prayer. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to James 5, verses 13 through 20? And if you don't have your Bibles with you, we'll have the words on the screen for your encouragement. James 5, verses 13 through 20. This is the word of the Lord. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens opened up and gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back or brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we live in a world in the depths of chaos and of brokenness and of sin, and it's hard to endure and persevere, even though we might have those intentions, because we ourselves are lacking, and we are found wanting before the righteousness and justice of heaven. And yet, we are gathered here today because of your generosity and because of your grace, and we lift up songs of praise because we know that no matter our circumstances, you are worthy of them. And we trust in not only your sovereignty and presence with us, but we trust that your work is not yet finished. And that the promise of the gospel, the grace of heaven, is continuously offered to those who faithfully submit and obey in walking after you. And so beyond what we feel, beyond what we have been experiencing here, Father God, would you help us to know that you are good and that your love truly does endure forever. And as the authority of your word is bound over us, would you give us strength? Would you inspire us? Would you convict us? And would you help us, Father, in our unbelief? Would you help us even in just what we know to be translated into the reality of our lives for your glory and for our good? And would you give us purpose that goes beyond the expectations of this world? Give me strength at this time and help me to serve your church and your name well. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Generations ago, in Hawaii, an old man took a very young boy, and they went into the woods, and they grabbed a nondescript piece of tree that was on the ground, and the old man said to the boy, through this piece of wood, I'm going to have you dancing on the water. Now, that's a very weird thing to say to anybody, but the boy looked at this crazy old man, and he said, how is this old rotting piece of wood going to help me to dance on the water. And so they picked this piece of tree up and they took it somewhere. And then this man said, sit down there and watch me. And for one day and for two days, which turned into five, six, seven days, this man took a very small tool and began to shave off millimeters of the tree. It's painstaking work. It's annoying work. If you're into filing or organizing and you can sit in a cabinet room all day and do that, I don't know what's wrong with you mentally. But I can't handle any of that. But after a week turned into two weeks, and even three and four, finally this nondescript piece of tree was turning into something else. It was flat. It was smooth. It was agile. And finally, after all this time, the, the man said to the boy, come with me. And they carried this piece of tree to the water, and they put it 
into the waves and it floated. And as you can all imagine, being in Hawaii, the old man taught this young boy to surf. And that's how this history was passed down among the people, the indigenous people of Hawaii. You take an old piece of wood, you grab a tool, and for weeks upon weeks, you don't put it into a machine, but you methodically and repetitively shave off layer after layer to shape and to form. And the thing that comes out of it in persistence, not creativity, not knowledge, but the thing that comes out of it in persistence is a board that allows you to truly dance on water. Now, I've never been surfing. Uh, I love the water, as many of you know, but I don't find the interest of sitting in the oceans, lying on a whatever it is, and then waiting for a wave to come, and then jumping up on a thing that doesn't balance easily, and then trying to wa ride a wave. I'm perfectly comfortable just sitting in three feet of water and bobbing up and down. That's comfort for me. But there are things in life that we take for granted and we perhaps take the perspective of this young boy on. We're not wanting to methodically commit ourselves to the same thing over and over again. And if I really want to challenge us today in the context of what James closes his letter in, and remember why that's important. The, the last part of a letter is the final word that the one writing it is passionately wanting to leave his audience with. It's like the last words of a dying person. It carries extra weight. And James is closing his letter with an encouragement and a call to prayer. And you and I as Christians know conceptually in our minds that prayer is important, that it's a powerful thing, that as Christians we are to pray. And yet, like that young boy, in the reality of our lives, we see it more of a chore. It's something that we kind of have to do in the eight seconds before we eat. We should go to prayer meetings. We should do the call to confession. But when it really comes down to it, we are unwilling and perhaps unable, and we have failed in committing ourselves to daily walking after the gospel, after the sovereignty of God, prayerfully. It's interesting that James ends his letter in prayer because he's an incredibly practical man. This is why I love the letter of James. I'm a practical person. Don't talk to me about high concept art. If we ever go to the Museum of Modern Art, do they have one in San Jose or in San Francisco? I'm going to be bored for three hours. Why? This square represents the postmodernism movement of North. It's a square. I could have done this. Give me a paintbrush in four minutes. I want to look at landscapes and sculpture that actually takes talent. If you're a modern art fan in here, I'm sorry. I'm just too dumb. But it's interesting that he ends with prayer because he's such a practical man. I mean, think about the things that he talked about. He talks about spiritual discipline, living out our faith in action, controlling our tongues, warning against loving the world, having no favorites, but striving to love each other equally and passionately. Do not exploit or ignore the suffering of others. And yet, at the end of it, he comes to this so-called spiritual discipline of prayer. The priority and path of prayer, though, to a Christian life is the air that we breathe. The priority of prayer in the path of a Christian life is the air that we breathe because it's the intimate freedom that we have to not just in that moment of prayer, but to in all of life to walk with God in knowing him and also being known by God. Now he transforms us. In the first three verses, he gives us the practice of prayer. And it's pretty simple. Is any of you suffering? Pray. You have hardship in your life? It's difficult? You have burdens and obstacles? Pray and tell God. Not because he doesn't know, but because he wants you to humbly correct your posture and let him know as a loving father so that he can also minister to you and shape your heart and mind. Is anyone cheerful? Are you happy? Are you joyful? Is life going well for you? Great. Worship, sing his praises, and pray in thanksgiving. Is anyone sick? Share your burdens with one another. Share your request of need and pray for one another together. This is a novel concept, isn't it? Someone has to have surgery, someone's sick, someone's not doing well. We, especially as predominantly Asians, what do we do? We don't say anything. Why? Because it's my life. 
I want to show you the Mercedes in the parking lot. I want to show you the 17 bedroom house. I want to show you my executive vice president label. I want to show you that my business has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. But any sign of weakness, any sign of need, you and I are inherently bad at. And yet scripture in the gospel is telling us when you experience sickness, hardship, difficulty, failure, suffering, share with one another and dare to pray, to intercede and come before God as a community and pray. In faith, prayer will save the sick. God will raise those who are suffering. God will heal. And James is pretty simply put on that. And I want to be uh, kind of clear on the expectation. Praying to God that my beloved one will be healed of cancer is not merely a guarantee because I simply prayed. But James says those who are sick and those who are stumbled by sin may be saved or healed by God, meaning that sometimes God's plans are beyond our understanding. And though he might not save their physical body from death, from suffering and hardship, he is saving and restoring their souls. And this is where so much of the church, especially in our postmodern American system, we've stumbled on this because of this whole idea of prosperity, and if God loves you, he'll give you what you want. I disagree. If God loves you, he won't give me what we want because our desires and wants are incredibly sinful. And yet God invites us to know him, invites us to intimately connect with him in prayer, and he saves and restores ultimately our eternity for his good, for his glory, for our redemption. I'm not saying don't pray, but I am saying and encouraging to the church through the gospel, through the word of God, Prayer is a means in not only which God moves, but how we can be moved as well, and how our perspective is corrected. James closes his first three verses by saying that the prayer of a righteous man or woman, a righteous man or woman being one who believes in faith and earnestly commits him or herself to prayer, is a powerful thing. Is a powerful thing. You know why I'm horrible at prayer? Maybe a pastor shouldn't say this to the church. You know why I'm bad at praying and committing myself to prayer first? I'm an incredibly practical man. If you're poor, I'll try to give you money. If you sprained your ankle, I'll go and bandage it. I'm really good at that because I've sprained both ankles 17 times. If I see a homeless person on the street, after I get over my initial discomfort, I will try to pull over and give them the clothes that I have saved in my, in my trunk for this or give them any cash in my pocket. But what I fail to do on a regular basis is I fail to do these things out of a prayerful heart first. And the challenge that James gives at the end of the first three verses is not that the actions of a righteous man or woman are powerful, but he says it begins with our posture before God, and it begins with our intimacy with God, and it begins with a prayerful heart and mind with God that actually transforms us and uses us mightily for the kingdom of heaven. This means that prayer is the means by which God fellowships with and communes with his people to reveal, to move, to convict. It's not us. It's not. I'm sorry to tell us this, but it's not because you and I are good or generous on our own. We aren't. That conviction to love someone, that conviction to go and pray with and for someone, and that conviction to be generous or forgiving or merciful or just, it's, a, it's not a human condition, but a God-inspired one. It begins in prayer. This isn't planned, but it's relevant, so I'm going to share it with you. Our apartment complex is a parking lot. That's probably normal, so I maybe shouldn't have started with that. Um, But it's a huge lot, and you go into the bottom of our building, and um, my wife's spot, there's a person, to the left of it's a wall, and to the right of it is a car, and we're all assigned parking. And this person that's on the right, um, their nationality or whoever's in their family is not important, but they're just bad at parking. And I'm like many of you. I, I don't become a different person when I drive, But why are people dumber when they drive? I don't understand. And so I've seen my wife pull into the garage and park, and there's no room on the right side for easy maneuvering. And so as a husband, it infuriates me 
that this person is inconsiderate, knows that we're Asian, and is parking bad to be racist. No, that's not it at all. They're just bad at parking. And so time after time this happened, and I have no problem telling you that my wife is an incredibly more righteous and prayerful person in her day-to-day life than I am. My response was, I'm going to call the residence office, find out the apartment that they live in, go knock on their door, and I'm a huge dude, stand there intimidatingly and say, you need to get your stuff together. How dare you inconvenience my wife in the parking? In fact, we switched spots because I wanted to pull in one day and have them park their car horribly, and I was just going to stand there and be like, come on. That was my genuine and honest desire. My wife did something differently. One morning I went to my car and I got in and I looked frustratingly at the car next to me and I saw a little piece of paper on the driver's window. And I thought, that's weird, because she didn't tell me that she was going to write them a note. And I hope she wrote some nastiness in there. Like, listen, dummy. And so I got out of my car and I went to the window and it was in her perfect handwriting, dear neighbor, please, please park better. Because sometimes it is difficult for me when there is not enough room. And I want to be a good neighbor, and I trust that you are trying to be a good neighbor. And so can we just all just do better? I'm not mad. I wanted to crumble that note or flip it over and be like, listen, dummy. All right? The justice of Christ will come through for sinners are bad parkers and you'll go to hell. So I left and came back, and I came back at the end of the first day, they hadn't moved their car because of whatever, and the note was still there, and the second day, the note was still there, and the third day, finally, I come back, and there was a note, uh, in the morning, there was a note, that same piece of paper on my car, and it said, dearest neighbor, oh my gosh, it was never my intention to park in a horrible manner, and I'm so sorry that I inconvenienced you. I will indefinitely work on parking better. And I knew immediately that I was a sinner and that this is my fault and I was not prayerful. And oh, I just felt like a horrible human being. In fact, I didn't tell Charlene that they wrote us back because I was so filled with frustrated shame for a couple of days. It's crazy. But beloved church, you and I are nat- not naturally righteous people. And it's, it's because we don't spend time in the wisdom of God, yes, and time in the word of God, yes. But it's also because we see prayer not as a part of our life existing, what gives us strength and hope and perspective and conviction. We see it as something to do once in a while. And James is very practically but also passionately telling the church, the prayer of a righteous man and woman intimately, humbly connected and devoted to praying passionately because we trust in God, not ourselves. This is a powerful thing for the kingdom of heaven. He continues in 17 and 18, gives us an example of prayer. He says there's this guy named Elijah who was a sinful man himself. Did you know that? Elijah was actually an angry, depressed, frustrated human being, and yet we think of him as this like, mighty prophet of justice and strength. No, dude had issues. And yet, God not only chose him to be his prophet, God not only used him powerfully to shape and form his people, but Elijah, for all of his human faults, one of the benefits of who he was in character was that he knew he was nothing and that God was everything. And that man, despite his anger, despite his frustration, despite his depression, that man, if anything else, prayed And in the midst of all the craziness and failure of his life, Israel, God's people, was failing and disobeying in sin. And Elijah said, as God called him, pray that there would be a famine. And Elijah said, fine, if that's what you want me to do, I'll pray. And Elijah said, God, let there be a famine in the lands. And for over three years, it didn't rain. Isn't that crazy? And finally, when Israel learned their lesson, apparently not for the last time, God said to his servant, hey, will you pray? Will you pray that I will send rain? And Elijah said, dear God, you are mighty. Would you send the rains? Not just so that it rains, but so that your glory would be revealed to all of your enemies and to your own people, that they would finally obey you and do what they say that they'll do. And immediately there was rain. Not just rain, but it was rain rain. 
to the point where Elijah had to run to escape the torrential downpour and flooding that happened. James's point is that if this angry, frustrated, depressed man clings to God in prayer and is the example that he is giving, then what excuse do you and I have? What are we holding on to apart from God? Elijah is not powerful in himself, but Elijah's prayer is powerful because he trusts in a powerful God. Our prayers are not inherently powerful. And it legitimately and honestly breaks my heart that I grew up in a church culture and I grew up in an ethnic culture where we go to dawn prayer and kill ourselves every day just so that our kids can go to Harvard. That we think the more often or the, loud, the more loudly or the more passionately that we pray or speak in tongues, that that is what will change God's mind. And yet, I never went to Harvard. My best friend's mom, before she passed when we were younger, I asked her, holy woman, my second mom, why do you pray so early in the morning? And she said, because I love God, but really because I want my son, my best friend, to go to Harvard or Yale or whatever. And I could have told her, hey, can you stop wasting your time? Because he's dumb. He's never going to get in. Pray for something better. But we do this, don't we? We earnestly enter into seasons of prayer when we want something, when we so desperately need something. And then we're done. This isn't what Elijah portrays. This isn't what Abraham portrays or Jesus himself portrays. Prayer is not a one-time thing. It is a life lived under the authority and sovereignty of God that goes beyond what we do in this room or when we hold prayer meetings. But literally, prayer is simply communing and walking and talking with God wherever you go. Some of my best times of prayer have been by myself in the middle of nowhere, just walking somewhere. And I just dialogue. I literally talk to God as if he's there. And the crazy thing is some of you might think that's not formal and that's not worthy of his glory. That's, that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He said to his disciples from time to time, I'm weary of you. And he went by himself into nature, into the woods, into a garden, into the mountains. And he just sat there talking with God. And prayer wasn't this like majestic oral just display of good language or formal language or eloquent language. Remember Jesus? He said, I don't want to do any of this. I am so frustrated by their stupidity, by their unfaithfulness, by their constant lies and lack of obedience. And there were also moments where Jesus stood up in front of thousands of people and said, Oh, Heavenly Father, would you multiply this bread and this fish? And there are other times where he cursed people and cursed generations of unfaithful people in praying, ironically, still for them and pointing out their sin. Prayer is not eloquence. Prayer is communing and talking with God wherever you go and whatever you're doing. And this is the example that Elijah gives us also. And he closes in the last two verses by saying, the purpose of prayer then is to not only know God, but horizontally with one another. The purpose of prayer is to encourage one another after the righteousness of God. To imitate the love of Christ. And the example that James gives here is that if one of us in the, in the community and fellowship of the church falls to sin and falls away from the gospel, then prayerfully and lovingly we should, one, pray, and two, go and reach out to them in love and speak well and bring them back. Now, the two things that James points out at the end, prayer and discipline or holding one another accountable lovingly, is something that you and I are incredibly disobedient to and bad at. I'm confident that the church loves me. I'm confident that in some way or form you love me. Even if you don't like me at a minimum level, there's a respect because I have pastor before my name. But my wondering is, how is, what is the depth of our love for one another? And in, in years of ministry and seeing the church fail and succeed and fail and succeed, I'm convinced that the depth and the reality of our love is not found in the positive or easy or good parts, but it's found when things are difficult. If I stumble as a pastor, as a man, as a husband, as a person, and you know it, Will you not only have the courage, but obedience in the gospel to one, pray for me, and two, to approach me 
lovingly and to say, brother, will you confess and repent of your sin? And you know, the reason why I say we fail at that is because how dare we make each other uncomfortable and encroach upon the private walls that we have built up? Oh, we'll gossip about one another. Did you hear that Amanda likes red socks, not pink ones? What a sinner. We'll treat each other passive-aggressively differently. We'll, 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 we'll spread rumors about one another, but we will not prayerfully and humbly and lovingly go to that person and say, will you come back to God with me and pray not only for, but with that individual? This is the purpose and point of prayer, horizontally, with and for one another. It's not that I just pray for you, but it's that I follow up with you. It's that we walk together. It's that we do it together. The thing that strikes me with praying for and with one another is that people still respond differently and in a weird way when even as a pastor, after having a conversation, I say or ask, can we pray about it right now? They, they, they tense up. This is weird. Can you just do it in your office when we're not together? And it, it saddens me because, one, that means that I'm not praying with you enough as a pastor but two, it, it saddens me and frustrates me because it means that we are not praying with and for one another enough. That it's a strange thing. It's like they're asking each other, how's your spiritual walk with Christ going? Why, who asked that? What are you, a super Christian? Weirdo? But isn't that why we are bound together as the church? I don't care what you ate last week. I mean, I care immensely, and I want to go there if it's good. But what we talk about is, only, if, it's, if, if what we talk about is only food, only movies and culture and Spotify and the new Korean drama on Netflix or whatever we're watching, what differentiates us from the world? James's encouragement in the last two verses is that in prayer we are to chase one another in love and in prayer and to restore them to the grace of God as Christ chased after us and loved us unconditionally, and prayerfully intercedes on our behalf, even today, as the Spirit groans. What does this mean for us? First is that the prayer of faith is a core part of our life together. Praying is not only an individual act, but James is pointing out that prayer is a core and essential part of our lives together. We are to address suffering, we are to celebrate, we are to bring one another towards salvation, we are to pray for healing and restoration in our bodies, but also in our souls, and we are to do it together, we are to do it together, we are to do it together. Beyond parents and children, beyond husband and wife, or boyfriend or girlfriend, or community, or life group members, or whatever we do, as a church, we are to pray, pray pray together. In fact, my contention for us would be that there is no Christian community and there is no Christian love for one another without actually praying for and with one another. Now, conceptually, it seems pretty easy, right? But you would not believe how difficult it is to spend even 14 seconds to pray for someone else consistently, especially if they're not intimately tied with you in your life. Part of my daily routine when I come to the office is I put everything down and I set up my laptop and I get some music going in the background and I pray for the first at least 10, 15 minutes. I have a list of people, I have a list of things that's on my heart. And as a pastor, there's a second list of just people at church and all these things going on. And the, and the, the consistency with which I hit 15 minutes is not that great. Because something else will come up. Someone will email me, someone will text me, and I will have to respond to them right away. Or sometimes I've literally just gotten bored of praying for some of you. I have. I'm, I just have. God, please be with Eric. It's just work is busy. Oh my gosh, YouTube's coming out with another thing. Or please be with so-and-so or whatever. And frankly, just even in my life, there are people that I've been praying for for 30 years. And I'm just like, at this point, mentally, even though I'm going through the motions of saying it in words, like... God, if you don't know, if you're not going to do it by this time, like, what's the point? But the point, again, is not the result. The point is that we faithfully would trust that God is still good and that he is still greater and that we should pray for, persevere in praying with and for one another. There is no church without prayer. There isn't. 
And I'm not going to guilt us into this, because as you should know, guilt doesn't work. But when we gather together as community groups, when we gather together for prayer meetings like we did last night at 5, hopefully none of you showed up at 7, because that was my concern, because apparently we're not good at reading emails, because I gave you four sentences instead of two. When we have opportunities together, do we see it as a priority to become the church as one? Or is Sunday worship the most important thing? Because we prepare for it and we're used to it because we do it every weekend for years. When someone shares with you, I'm not okay, I'm suffering, I'm sick, I'm not doing well, is our first inclination to go with them together before the presence of God? Because in the frank reality of things, what I've realized in looking in the mirror is, what can you really do for someone? Not a lot. What can I really do for you? Oh, I'm sorry, you stubbed your toe. Well, lay down and let me just x-ray it. No. Suck it up, get over it. It's going to be okay tomorrow. Maybe that helps with some of you. Prayer is the thing that we can do. Prayer is the tool that we have been given, and prayer is the intimate freedom that we have not only individually, but together to go before God. If we do not pray with and for one another, another, then we don't love one another. Let's just be very clear on that. And many of us, including myself, have failed. The second thing is this. Prayer is not an event, but who we are. Prayer is not a one-time thing in our day-to-day lives, but it's who we are in our identity and core. It is. You know, if we wanted to get really technical and nerdy, if you go into the Greek that James uses, the term term that he uses to pray is not a singular event or a verb that ends after that one time, but it's in this tense where it's continuous, ongoing, never-ending. So what he's actually saying is when you're suffering, when you're sick, when you're not doing well, when you have obstacles, when you have hardship, pray, 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 pray. Pray one time, then pray again, then keep praying and pray for the other person and continue to gather. And when you get together, continue to pray. Pray this time, pray next time, the time after that. Our lives are to be saturated in intimately walking in and after Christ in prayer together. It's the same thing as breathing. You and I don't consciously think about breathing because it's hardwired into our brain. There's a smidgen of the gray gooey stuff in our brain where it controls the fact that our bodies breathe whether we think about it consciously or not. This is prayer. And honestly for me at this point I get bored. Why? Because I've gone to church every Sunday of my life and we're always told to pray and we fail or we choose not to and we disobey and then we have the audacity to wonder Why am I not intimately tied with those whom I call brothers and sisters? Why is my trust and my dependence on the sovereignty and power and the grace of God not any different than it was 15 years ago? And it's not because God isn't great, but it's because we don't trust in his greatness enough to submit, to surrender, to pray. Again, our prayer is not the thing that changes us but humbly coming before God as a part of who we are, as our identity. That is the means by which the Holy Spirit transforms and smooths and matures us. And finally, prayer is the means by which we walk with Christ and grow in his likeness. The reality and secret part of our lives is that we view prayer as a secondary priority in what we do. And if you tell me that I'm wrong, then I will lovingly tell you you're a liar. Prayer is the means by which we walk with Christ and we become like him. There is no other alternative. The word of God and reflection and prayer. Because like I said, if you have a great day and all that you want to do is be like Christ to other other people, give it a day. You'll wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Your alarm will go off. Someone will call you and interrupt you. Your stomach will hurt and you'll get no sleep. You'll become an insomniac like me. And I've discovered, especially moving up here, if I sleep less than five hours, the day's basically over. Yesterday I was on two hours, and it was everything I could do to be upbeat and positive. And we had a prayer meeting, and I, before I went up there, and I was like, please help me not to scream at people up here. And it wasn't because I don't love you. 
It's because I wasn't on sleep, on good enough sleep. But prayer is the means by which we are transformed, in which we can know and become like Christ. Prayer is the means by which God inspires and calls us to kingdom work. Just examples from scripture, because I want to make sure that you know that I'm not just speaking here. God parts the Red Sea because his leadership prays. God wins victories for his people because Moses commits to raising his hands in prayer and glorifying him. God calls us not to do powerful and amazing things, but he says, through you, I will do these things, but prayerfully come before me and obey. The walls of Jericho didn't happen because the sound waves vibrated off the walls and all this stuff that, if you're familiar, read it. But it was because God commanded them to prayerfully go and do what he called them to do. And as they obeyed him, God caused the walls to fall. Beloved, prayer is the means by which we participate in his work of redemption. And let me close with this. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Sometimes I feel like everything in ministry is, I feel like no matter what we've accomplished, no matter how good I become at something, no matter how many years pass, I constantly feel that I'm at the bottom of a mountain looking at a peak that I will never reach. And the, and the truth is that that's true. We will never reach that peak of full faithful maturity. We will never become finished with sanctification. But just because it seems difficult doesn't mean that we don't begin to climb. Because the promise of the gospel, that it's not on our ability, but on the power of the one we place our faith in. So if prayer is difficult for you, you're not special. God doesn't ask you to be perfect in it, but he does call us to be faithful in committing ourselves to pray with and for one another. So that he would be pleased and that he would continue to sanctify us in our lives. Is anyone among us suffering? Let them pray. Are you cheerful? Celebrating blessing in your life? Celebrate in prayer and thanksgiving. Is any of you sick or caught in sin? Would you confess and repent? Would you pray before God vertically, but would you also share your burdens with us together horizontally? And would we commit to obeying what God calls us to in prayer? Let's pray together. Father, would you help us to pray now, to pray together, and to pray always, as you have called us to in your word. Thank you that you speak to us in so many different ways, especially in scripture. At times you call us poetically and gently, at times you call us practically, and at times you give us the kick in the butt that we so desperately need. And today you've done it in all the ways. You gently remind us that it is not by our ability or by the strength of our prayers that anything is done, but that it is done by who you are. You call us to prayer so that we may know you, that we may be known by you, and in that, that we would be transformed and matured and sanctified in our righteousness. And Lord, we confess that honestly, prayer has not been a priority for us, and yet we wonder why it's hard to breathe in the life of faithfulness. We confess that we have not prayed for others generously and lovingly as you have generously loved us. And we confess that we have been the ones who determine who is worthy of our prayer and our attention rather than desperately seeking to reflect, to share, and to extend the grace of heaven to one another. And Father, as we confess of these things, would you help us to repent of them, to turn away, to turn away from our sin, our disobedience, our pride, our vanity, and to turn towards a loving obedience and surrender to you. Would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us in the Holy Spirit? And at this time, Father God, would you help us to pray and reflect? Not just in sitting there and closing our eyes with our hands folded, but that our lives would be saturated with dialoguing, with sharing, with creating space to be still and quiet in your presence. And Lord, that wherever we go, whatever we do, whomever we with, that we would prayerfully live as you convict, as you call, and as you give us the gifts to do things in your name. And it's in that very powerful name we pray. Amen.